to the Colorado National Monument. It doesn't get much better than this, does it? So beautiful up here. Hey, I want to ask you a question. Uh, by the way, welcome to the upper room. This is kind of uh, volume two, if you will. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever heard of Matthew Robinson? There's probably been a lot of Matthew Robinsons. Let me give you his middle name, Mackenzie. They, they called him Mac Robinson. I bet you don't know him. I'll bet you know his brother, though. His brother was a guy by the name of Jackie Robinson. Now, if you're not a sports fan, then I, I excuse you not knowing who this guy is. He was the guy that broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. He's in the Hall of Fame, Jackie Robinson amazing athlete. Almost anybody that knows anything about sports knows about his brother Jackie Robinson, but nobody really knows about Mac Robinson. Who was that guy? You know, you would know about Mac Robinson if it wasn't for four tenths of a second. Four tenths of a second! He broke the world record, uh, at least the Olympic record I know, in the 200 meters in 1936. Now I know most of us weren't alive back then, but why haven't you heard about a guy who broke the Olympic record in 1936 for the 200 meters? You know why you haven't? Because the guy that he finished behind just four tenths of a second was a guy by the name of Jesse Owens. Can you believe that? What bad luck is that? <laughs> That's terrible luck. You break an Olympic record and nobody knows who you are because you are four tenths of a second behind the great Jesse Owens. Second place finish. World record for just, well, actually he didn't break it because the world record was set four tenths of a second in front of him. You know what I like about this guy, about Mac Robinson? is that not only did he finish second to Jesse Owens, but he finished second to his brother, Jackie Robinson. Because everybody knows him and nobody knows his brother, Mac. But here's what I love. No sibling rivalry here. He was five years older than his brother, and he was instrumental in making sure that there was a statue erected to his brother at the UCLA baseball complex. You can see it there today in Westwood, California. Amazing. He wanted to honor his brother, and he is the guy that nobody remembers. Four tenths of a second. Have you ever heard of the Hubble telescope? The Hubble telescope, two and a half billion dollars to create the Hubble telescope. They launched it into space. You've seen the images, it's amazing. But did you know that before those images could be seen by us, Astronauts had to go up and fix something in this two and a half billion dollar project. The one lens that was an essential lens to that telescope was one one thousandth of an inch too wide. They didn't ground it down just one one thousandth of an inch. Now, is that a big deal? One one thousandth of an inch, four tenths of a second. What is the big deal, right? Those are small potatoes. Those are little things. One one thousandth of an inch. But this two and a half billion dollar project was no good until astronauts could get up into space and file that little lens down. <laughs> it's amazing how little things really matter. Most people say, oh, don't sweat the small stuff. But it's the small stuff that makes up the big stuff is the idea behind all this. So. What is all this about? I believe that when we talk about the church, we're talking about something that people say, well, what is the big deal? You know, uh, just small stuff you're talking about, about, uh, about things that we focus on. Last week, we got into this conversation and we started with an idea and it came from Simon Sinek and it's that, that graph of the three circles, remember, that businesses use called the golden circle. And on the inner circle is the why, then there's the how on the next circle. And then on the outer circle, the outer ring of that model is the what. Most businesses, Sinek says, start with the what 
but the businesses that succeed, the organizations that succeed in a huge way start with the why. So we start with the why last week, in case you missed that, that lesson, and we're gonna work our way outward, but we're gonna actually jump over the how. We'll get to the how later. Let's go right to the what. What is this idea of the upper room? What does it have to do with the church? What is the church about anyway? If we get the little details wrong about the church, is it really a big deal? Most would say no, it's not a big deal at all. You know, don't, don't worry about the small details. But the what of the church is not a small detail. It is a huge deal. It may seem small. It may seem like a, a four-tenths of a second. It may seem like a thousandth of an inch, but it's a big deal. And I want to talk to you about the what today. You see, I believe it's the what... I mean, we got the why figured out last week, but I believe it's the what that has kept this movement of the first century that took over Rome and took over the known world, it's kept it from continuing to be a movement because now, quite honestly, it's a monument. Kind of like this monument because I believe if we get the what wrong of what the church should be, what it ought to be, what God created it to be, if we get the what wrong, I think it turns into a museum. I think it turns into a monument. You can look across Europe and the church is a museum. Those cathedrals are just visited. It's not an active, flowing, organic, growing thing that the church was in the first century. Is there any evidence in this Western modern church that this has happened? I, I think there is. I think there is. I mentioned it in the last lesson. Let me recap again. I think the fact that People are not seeing any difference in the lives of the people inside the church than outside the church. Children of the families are growing up to leave the church, not to return. Uh, we're seeing, uh, I mentioned it last week, we're seeing pastors being abused, pastors becoming celebrities, pastors falling off the pedestal. Uh, we're seeing so many signs that this thing is moving towards what happened in Europe. But that's not what God had in mind is the problem. And I think it's about what we focus on, what we fix on. Now, it's easy to say, well, here's the big picture, you know, the big picture of the church, but it's the small things that make up the big things. It's the four tenths of a second. It's the one one thousandth of an inch. And in this case, I believe because of the things the church currently focuses on, it's brought us to a place where quite honestly, scripture told us would happen. Uh, we read it last week. Let me read it to you again out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. But mark this, Paul says, mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You think he's talking about our culture and you'd say, absolutely, we see all this, this narcissism and this violence and, and just self-indulgence in our culture. But then we come to this phrase, they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. He is talking about the church in the last days. The church will lose its focus. And I believe with all my heart we have. In a lot of ways, not in the biological sense, but in a lot of ways we look at evolution, the evolution of something as a good thing, like technology. I mentioned that again last week, that when technology evolves, it's amazing how different it is. You know, I mean, a long time ago, if you lived up in these areas, smoke signals was how you communicated, right? You did not ever text somebody on the other side of the world. The evolution of technology has been amazing. The evolution of the church, just the opposite. The evolution of the church has brought us to a place where we are people who try to look godly, but for the most part, we deny the power of the gospel. Our, the power of the gospel does not flow through us and is not apparent to the world around us. Again, we're seen as though we're no different than anyone else in this culture. And uh, we're actually looked down upon by the culture by the fact that we aren't what we claim to be. And that's what Paul was warning about. In the last days, this will happen. We are in the last days. It has happened. Can anything be, be done about it? 
I have some ideas about what we have done wrong to get here and maybe something we could correct to go the other direction, to reverse what's happened to the modern Western church. Okay, let me, let me give this to you. I told you I've been in leadership in the church for 35 years in the Western modern church. I'm gonna give you what I call the big seven. These are the things I think that the modern church focuses on that has brought us. They seem like no big deal, but maybe little things to some people, but I think they have brought us to a place where we've lost our way. Okay, so let's, let's go for it. Uh, let's start with uh, one that's pretty obvious. I'm just gonna call it music. Music. Music is a big deal in the church. And it's okay to say that music is a part of worship, but what's happened is we've redefined music in the church as worship. That's not how worship is defined in scripture. You know, in Romans chapter 12, the first couple of verses, it says that our everyday life, how we live out our life in Christ, is our act of worship. Can music be a part of that? Sure, it can, but really, it's a small part of it. But we have made this a focus. We've made this something we're fixated on. And music probably has actually split more American modern Western churches than anything I know. And so what do we do with that? Well, we can still sing praise to God. We're, we're told to do that. But we, it can no longer be a focus of who we are. So I think music has become a huge distraction. That's the, the first, the first uh, thing that I noticed that we fixate on. The second one is money, and that's pretty simple, right? I mean, you can't go to a gathering of the modern church without having something passed in front of you, urging you to you know, shell out money. It, you can't go through a service without something being said about it. I've never been in a leadership meeting, an elders meeting, where money wasn't brought up as a topic in some form or another. And scripture is very clear about the role of money. All it does is reveal our hearts because our, our, our hearts follow our investment. But to make money uh, a huge fix, fixation in the modern church uh, is a real problem. And, and we, we've got to figure out what to do with that. The third issue I see that we fixate on, that we focus on, is simply man. Man, meaning men or women, but mankind. We put the focus on people. And I mentioned this earlier, but it's the idea of celebrityism. Is that a word? I don't know if it's a word, but celebrityism. The idea that we love to make celebrities out of people. The culture does it, and we look at that and say, oh, that's a good idea. Men are made into celebrities. Men crave to be celebrities. They, they crave the attention. And guess what? When they're put on that pedestal, they either fall off or they get knocked off. They either uh, fall into temptation or they get abused, whatever the case may be, because man has become a focus. I've experienced this uh, again and again, whether people want to put me on a pedestal or I've been in so many congregations where the man, you know, the man was put on the pedestal. And I've served with men who've had their names put in stone out in front of the building to know that's my place. I'm in charge there. I've had professors in college that said, you, I demand you call me Dr. So-and-so. If not, you know, then you got to get out of my class or uh, all kinds of things like that that are crazy. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul writes this in verse 1. When I came to you, he said, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. He says, it wasn't about me. It wasn't about how eloquent I was, how well I spoke. He says, that, that wasn't it at all. He goes on to say this, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words that your faith may not rest on human wisdom. Instead, he said, it must rest on God's power. So a focus on man is a, is a real problem that it, it can mess us up with a what. What are we about? Uh, we're not about music. We ought not to be about music. We ought not to be about money. We ought not to be about man or whoever we want to elevate into that position. Uh, the fourth issue I see in the modern church is the message. Um, the message has become uh, really diluted. And, and I used to have people tell me that all the time. But when I was focused on you know, leading in the church and preaching every Sunday. I didn't really pay attention to the message that was out there in the modern church. Uh, in my time since I resigned my position, I've had a lot of time to listen to a lot of leaders and teachers in other churches. And I got to agree. What I was being told, I kind of didn't believe. 
It's true. The message is being watered down. The most common thing right now is the social justice me message that really we feel like God wants us to, you know, create social change because the culture is demanding that. So the culture now is motivating us instead of God's word and God's word alone. So the message that we're focusing on is the wrong message. Again, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, I want to say it again. I resolved, he said, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, when I came to you and I spoke to you, he said, I could have spoken about a lot of things, but I resolved that it would be about one thing, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. He goes on to say, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Again, he says, when, when I talked to you, you saw the Spirit of God flowing from me. It was his message about, about Jesus Christ and the power of the resurrection, the power of what he did for us. It wasn't about, well, you know, we need to act more like the culture wants us to, and we need to be relevant to the culture. The message that we have focused on, that we fixated on, may seem like a little thing. Paul says it was all important. It's not a little thing. It's a huge thing. The fifth point about what I think we, we've really gotten wrong in the modern Western church is the myriad of programs. I mean literally hundreds and hundreds of programs. That is, we try to make everybody happy. And it especially uh, is targeted towards certain age groups. I was actually in a congregation one time uh, on staff where we had a different pastor for every age group from the infants all the way to the seniors. I mean, we had pastors for the people in their 20s, a different pastor for the people in their 30s, different pastor for the people in their 40s, on up. Go down to, you know, junior high, later elementary. We separated everybody out. Well, you don't see that in scripture, but the culture demands that, you know, we meet them where they are, is the idea. And so, the myriad of programs, usually it's age separated, distinctive, sometimes gender, but we have, it has become a focus of ours. In our last ministry we were involved in, we came and said, well, let's bring all people together, all ages together. And when we, we suggested this, there was a huge uprising and people demanded, what are you doing? You're ruining what the church is about. And the point was the church was never supposed to be about the programs, right? One guy actually asked me, he said, where have you seen this before? Because that's not what I'm seeing when I look around ch churches in America. And I responded humbly, but honestly, you know where I've seen it? I've seen it in God's Word. Yeah, in God's Word. There's no distinction between age and gender and race and all those things. We are all one in Christ, but when we separate everybody out and we program specifically for them, that becomes the focus. And I know it does because I had many people, I can't tell you how many, more than I could count, who tried to get rid of me, who actually came after me, tried to ruin me because I refused to fulfill their need for programs. Now, where is that in Scripture? It's nowhere in scripture, but we're so focused and so fixated. This is no little thing. It may seem like a little thing. It may seem like just a, a you know, four tenths of a second or one one thousandth of an inch. It's a big deal. It's become a big deal in the modern church. The sixth one is what I'm going to call the mood. And that's simply the atmosphere. The atmosphere that we feel like we have to create in the modern Western church, it has to do with lighting. It has to do with temperature. It has to do with seating arrangements and comfort. It has to do with with coffee, <laughs> caffeine, refreshments. You know what it is when you boil it down to it? I'm just going to be honest with you. And again, I know that most of you are going to be ticked off by a lot of this stuff, but it's okay. Most of it is appealing to the flesh. We go, what, what does the flesh of the people want? What do they demand? And we do all we can do to meet those demands of the flesh. The focus isn't on the Spirit of God and what He's doing and whether He's even here. i got to tell you this. Someone, and they were someone famous, I don't remember who it was, once said, if the Spirit of God left your church, would you even notice? I don't know how that makes you feel, but I've been in a few congregations where I'm not sure we would notice whether He was there because we're taking care of all those needs through programming and through atmosphere, through moods, that kind of thing. 
Uh, the last one I want to cover is what I'm going to call mores, but what a more is often seen as is tradition. And that simply is something that splits churches, destroys churches all the time. That we become so fixated on our traditions that they become more important than Jesus himself. And Jesus talked about this because it was a problem back in the first century. And he says to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God. Can you imagine telling religious leaders that you're rejecting the commands of God? And then he says, here's how I know you're doing this. He says, because you do it in order to establish your tradition. You've replaced the commands of God with your traditions, he says. You make void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down in all the things you do. Jesus, it's in their face. I think he would do that today in the modern American church. We have traditions. Uh, the tradition I mentioned that we kind of put to bed when we came to our last congregation was the idea of, of, of youth ministry, student ministry. We just said, no, let's put people together. You would have thought that I just ripped out half the Bible. You, you seriously would have thought that. Because we literally have come to the place where we will be fine without the commands of God. Just, we have to have our traditions. Okay, so my question to you is, I just covered a bunch of things that we get fixated on, we get focused on, that we say, oh, they're no big deal. But they are a big deal. And they end up being a big deal, right? From music, to, to uh, man, to money, to the message being the wrong message, to the mores, to the atmosphere, the mood, all those things. Now, are any of those evil things? No, in of themselves, they are not evil things. Money is not an evil thing, right? The love of money, the focus on money is an evil thing, right? The mood, the atmosphere, look at this atmosphere. But if I begin to worship this atmosphere, I'm in trouble. There's nothing wrong with music. Not at all. God gave us music. But if that becomes the focus of my life and I, and I say, I'll die on this hill, we got to have my music. See, any of these by themselves are not a problem. But when we fixate on them, that's when there's a huge problem. And the bottom line is we get to this place where there's a famous comedian who talked about this and he called it the me monster, you know, and I love how he did it, you know, the me monster. The me monster is, I want what I want. And that's what we have in the modern Western church. We have millions of people saying, I want what I want. I want the atmosphere to be a certain way. I want the music to be my way. I want the message to be something that appeals to my ears. I want the right man in front of me teaching me. I want all this stuff. It's the me monster that has come after us. All right. And that is what we want to talk about. So why is that a big deal? You say, so what? That's what it's become. Is this a good thing that this is what the church has evolved into? Do you remember last week when I talked about William Wallace and, and the movie Braveheart and how he, he turned to the Scottish nobleman and he said, you know, we've defeated the English, but they'll come back. That's kind of how he says, it. but they'll come back. And uh, they say, oh, no, no, we won't fight him again. He says, we have to. We have to. And then he turns to them and says, the, the difference between you and me, William Wallace says in this movie, is that, is that you believe people uh, are there to support your position. I believe your position is there to provide freedom for the people. And the line that he uses is, you're so busy fighting over Longshanks, the king, the evil king of England, over Longshanks scraps that you don't know how good your life could actually be without that. We are so busy. I look at all these, these, the seven things I just gave you, and I could have given you 10 or 20, but let's say those seven things. We're so focused on those seven things, we don't realize that's the scraps off Satan's table. I mean, that stuff Satan's throwing to us, we're going, we're lapping it up instead of taking what God has for us, which is so much greater. And I'm about to show you what that means. Francis Chan, in his uh, excellent book called Letters to the Church, says this, it's imperative that we differentiate between what we want and what God commands. In our impatient culture, we want to experience biblical awe without biblical devotion. We want the awe that we see in Acts. People being in awe. But we don't want to be devoted to God's word. And to being obedient to it is his point. So I take you back again to where we learn about the church for the first time. Acts chapter 2 verse 42. Here we go. They, that is... Those who were called out, that's what the word, the word church actually isn't in the Bible, it's a German word, but the, the called out ones, the ecclesia, that's who we are. 
those who were called out devoted themselves to these four things. Ready? The apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayer. Let me read it to you one more time. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, I'm going to ask you to pause the video and just talk amongst yourselves. What do you get from that? What does that say to you? That's one verse that talks about the first things we know about the early church. Pause it for just a second and just talk about what, what did you learn from that? I hope you had a good discussion. Okay, so the word devoted, let's zero in on that. The word devoted is a great word right there. And it means three things when you really understand it the way it's written in that language. It means continual, it means intense, and it means strong. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't see that in the modern Western church. I don't see continual. I see people who come and go as they please. They're hit and miss. If nothing else is going on in my life, I'll be here part of the gathering. Nothing continual. Nothing daily. And that's, you're going to find out they met daily. We, we would freak out. If you, if you started attending a church and they said, we're going to meet every day, people would go, I've got better things than do. Continual. This is continual. We live in a culture. Where, you know, again, the me monster is, well, that's not what I want to do all the time. I'll tell you what, I'll check in once a month, maybe twice a year. I don't see continual. I don't see intense. Intense. Think about it. When's the last time you were in a, a, a gathering of the fellowship and it got really intense in a good way? Not intense like fighting, but intense, just intent on passionate. I see passion lacking from the modern Western church, don't you? Intense, continual strong. There's a book that came out years ago called Why Men Hate Church. Great book. I think it's accurate. I think men, generally speaking, again, general, in general, men don't care for church because it's designed, really, um, with women in mind. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with all of that except that men are just, we're just not designed to come sit in a pew and listen for an hour and a half, sing some songs. There's no other place in culture where men love to do that kind of thing. They love to go to auditoriums or arenas and scream. They love to go out in nature like this and kill things, fish, hike. It's not made for, for men. And so this idea of it being strong, men don't see the church as strong. And the truth of the matter is, do you remember what Jesus said about his church? The gates of hell will not stand against my church. That's strength. The church will knock down the gates of hell. Is that what you're seeing right now? You see, we have evolved, and I don't know if anybody's honest enough to say, this is not good. This evolution of the church over the last 2,000 years is not good in so many different ways, so many different levels. Okay, let's look at the four themes. We're gonna, we're gonna go deeper into this, but again, there are four things that were the focus, okay? But even these four things are not really the focus. I'll show you what the real fixation the focus is. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, okay? Uh, what was that teaching about? You got it. Uh, to, the, to the breaking of bread, that is to meals, but especially one meal, Started by whom? Number three, breaking bread then to prayer or, or to the fellowship was the third thing. The fellowship is, what do we all have in common? In the first century church, what did they all have in common? You guessed it. Number four, and to prayer. What is the focus of prayer? It's a conversation with whom? Do you know what the focus is? There are four simple ways they went about this. John MacArthur has said this about the modern Western church. He said it is, uh, it is adolescent, even childish. Now, what does he mean? What he means by that is that we are people who are like children who demand our way and want things to please us. In the first century, the church, the what of the church was Jesus. That's what we are. We are Jesus people. We follow Jesus. And we do these ordinary things. Ordinary things, right? We, we were taught about him. And we have um, meals together. And he instituted the, the most important meal, right? The Lord's Supper. And then we all talk about what we have in common. And that's him. And then we pray to him. Jesus is the focus. This is no small deal. This is no small thing that's happened to the, to the modern church. 
where our focus is on everything but the Messiah. Do you get what I'm saying? We've made this so complicated. <laughs> Last week, I was just trying to, we have four lines with a company, a phone company, that, a cell phone company, and I'm not gonna tell you who they are, okay? Uh, doesn't matter that it starts with an S, ends with a T, that has nothing to do with it. All I wanted to do was take one line off. That's all I wanted to do, take one line out of four. Just knock that one line off, all right? It's one of our sons who's ready to take that on himself. Just take that one line off. Do you realize it took us like a week to make that happen? A week. It was so complicated. I couldn't believe how hard this was. I mean, they wanted our, our firstborn son. Well, he's too old for me to hand over to him. You know, they wanted DNA. They wanted, they wanted all kinds of things just to eliminate one thing. We've done that with the church. We've made this so complicated when in fact it is so simple. The church is about Jesus. Just Jesus. What if that happened again? What if we went from all the, you know, the myriad of programs and all the money and all the, the you know, messages that are uh, mixed with, you know, cultural uh, applications for us, all that kind of stuff, you know, the, all that, the music, all those things we talked about, right? And what if we just made it about the Messiah? Just the Messiah, just Jesus. That's why we're together. That's why we eat together. That's why we sing. It's always Jesus. And if it's always Jesus, then we have that in common, right? What's the, what's the big deal? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Let us run with endurance. There's that continual, keep it up. Well, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on the programs. Okay, 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 okay. Fixing our eyes on the money. No, no, okay, okay, okay. Fixing our eyes on the music. You know what it is. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's commanded. And of all the things we do, that's the one thing we have forgotten to do. Small thing? No. That, if you think that's a small thing, it's become the greatest thing. Okay, what was the result of them keeping Jesus as the focus? I pick it up in verse 43 of chapter 2 of Acts. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. One by one. I'm going to go through them with you. Ready? Here we go. Here's what happened when Jesus was the focus. Everyone was filled with awe. This is awesome. It's just an awesome thing to do. They were all together, not individuals, not independent. Independence Rock is right around the corner over here, not independent. They had everything in common. Do you feel like you have everything in common with the church, with all those in the church? They sacrificed their possessions for one another. This isn't socialism. This isn't Marxism. That's when people are forced into doing this. They did this on their own. They did this because the Spirit of God led them to. They made sure that their possessions weren't just their own, that they shared with anybody that had need. There were no needs among them. No needs among them. Can you imagine? They met together often, often. You know, we complain, uh, do I have to go more than once a month, once a week? That's killing me. They ate together. That's a huge part of this, eating together. They had glad and sincere hearts. That is, they had, they were authentic, sincere, authentic people. What is the accusation against the modern Western church? You guys are hypocrites. You're not sincere. And you've met us. You, you've met a lot of people in the modern Western church that sincere is never the word that comes to mind. They praised God, they enjoyed being together, the Lord added to their number. We're working so hard, how can we get more people? How can we get more people in the church? If we do this, if we meet all those fleshly desires, we'll get more people. That's not how it was in the original blueprint. God added in his time, in his way, and it was an amazing thing to behold. Okay, why don't we experience all these things 2,000 years later? I believe. It's because we have become fixated on the wrong what. The what is not all those things we started with. The what is actually a who. Jesus. So what is the what in the upper room? Okay, we're committed to it. We're, we're going to be devoted to it. What is the what? Here it is. Here's what we are. We are devoted followers of Christ in small communities. All right, we can talk about the small communities thing, why that's important. And it's not just a small community. We'll talk about the hybrid nature of what we want to do. But here's what we are, devoted 
devoted, intensely, continuously strong in our passion for Jesus, followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. All right, we're coming to you from the Lake Fork of the Gunnison. We're just gonna get a fly wet here, probably not bother any fish, uh, but we're gonna have some fun and I wanna wrap this up. We uh, have been talking about what the church has focused on that's brought us to this place of crisis in the church. And I want to wrap it up with a story about Napoleon. Now, the best part of Napoleon was that he was short. We all can agree upon that, right? But how did Napoleon have all those victories, all those conquests, all that success, and yet he is defeated at Waterloo? Well, historians argue endlessly about how he was defeated. It could have been the weather. It could have been just the setting that he was in. It could have been that he was an older man by now or that he was actually sick during that time. But one historian, or a few at least, have uncovered something really interesting I want to share with you. As they approached the battlefield, they had 100,000 Prussians on one side. And then they had Wellington's British on the other side. They were far outnumbered, but Napoleon, being the brilliant general he was, had his troops go in between and separate them. Then they turned on the, the English troops, and they forced them backwards. In fact, they overtook their cannons, 160 cannons. What a great feat by this army. But what a lot of people don't understand is that when the enemy would overtake cannons, they would usually stick a, a long rod kind of look like a long nail into the barrel of the cannon which would make it inoperable so that those cannons could not be used against them again. Small problem, Napoleon's troops forgot the nails, they forgot the rods. Whoever was supposed to do that forgot them. Napoleon is said to be on a hillside watching this and screaming at them to stick those rods in the barrels and they couldn't do it because Pierre or Francois, somebody forgot the nails and that. That wasn't very good French, but the bottom line is this. They continued to push the British, looked like success, looked like they were winning, but the British circled back around, their cannons were still viable, and that was the end of that battle, the end for Napoleon. Now, what's the point? Whether we're talking about four tenths of a second, one one thousandth of an inch, or a handful of nails, the small things matter, don't they? They really matter, and they matter in the church. And for some people who say, well, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? So we're focused on all these other things. That's a big deal. This is no small matter. If you think it's a small matter, the small matters become big matters. And again, as the upper room, we are focused on Jesus. That's our focus, that's what we are. We are Christ followers followers of Jesus who happen to live in small communities. And we'll talk more about that, but don't miss that. Colossians tells us that Jesus is the head of the church. You just can't push him aside. You just can't say, well, we're going to focus on the music and, and the atmosphere and all kinds of other things. The book of Ephesians says that Jesus sacrificed himself for the church. You can't just negate that. You can't just say that's some little thing. And finally, the book of Hebrews tells us that we must fix our eyes on Jesus. And so in the upper room, what are we? We are people who are passionate about following and focusing on Jesus. Letting all the other stuff get figured out. But that's where our focus will remain as we do life together in these small communities. Enjoy the upper room. So glad you're a part of it.